We're starting with introducing the pre-construction collaboration libraries. And this is our intro class for people who have little or no experience with SharePoint. We will go through how we upload, how we use the system. But we'll also look at how this product or this tool works within the uh, development environment, exchange of data between DOT and consulting firms. This is a part of a larger project to get electronic paper managed within DOT rather than having all these documents floating around in file cabinets and things like that. The goal is to have electronic access to paper from anywhere in the state for the appropriate people to see and use and work with. So what is the pre-construction site? This is the first step in a effort we have to get tools for DOT and consulting firms to share together. This is a SharePoint site that is a collection of tools for collaborating on transportation design projects between consultants and DOT staff. And it is accessible by everyone on the project and only the people that are appropriate to the project. Normally, and in the past, when you've been sharing information, you've either exchanged paper documents, printing them out, sending them to DOT, they make their comments, send them back. Uh, exchange of electronic documents, sending it via secure FTP or FTS, CD, something like that, to get information back and forth, email. What we're doing now is we're changing that paradigm a little bit. This is an alternative for FTS. It's a controlled access library that you share. It's a common workspace that you share. So we're avoiding duplication in many cases. It's a permanent repository. In FTS, you exchange information. That information in the FTS mailbox goes away after 30 days. And it's an exchange between individuals, not between groups of people. This exchange records who did what and when. So you don't have to put date time stamps on your files. They're already there. You have the ability to bundle files in a couple of different ways. We do have some file size limits. The uh, suggested file limit for files is 50 megabytes, especially if you're working remotely and have a network issue. Uh, 150 megabytes is the official ceiling. That's a soft one. We actually have people that have been able to exchange files close to 300 megabytes. Problem is, if we have very large files in a very slow network, the transfer will fail. So uh, wherever possible, bundle your files in a different way so that an individual file is no more than 50 megabytes most of the time and 150 megabytes if there is no other way around it. The pre-construction site is the official repository for exchange of information and managing permit documents. We're not going to be talking about eTracks, but it is our permit tracking tool. Uh, if you're working with environmental documents especially, the repository is here. The eTracks tool is used to keep track of who's done what, where, and the green oval shows the URL of the file as it sits in the pre-construction application. Now, this is the first step in replacing the standard project file structure, uh, what we at DOT call project store, or the R drive. Currently, when a project is turned over to a consulting firm, we send a standard file tree, a tree structure for what we call the R drive. Files are exchanged. You put them in the same place on the consultant side as you do on the DOT side, and all the references work. This is a shared space for non-CAD files and a tool for exchanging CAD files. Why did I call it a first step? We are actually in the process, and have been for the past two years, of working with Bentley Systems to get ProjectWise up and running. The SharePoint libraries are the default or state standard repository for final documents. This is the official repository of record or the tool for storage. When the decision to use SharePoint was made, you know, we discussed it with Microsoft, or DOT discussed it with Microsoft, and they said, yeah, we can handle CAD files. But what they what the decision makers didn't know was that references in CAD files are broken when managed through SharePoint. So for those that are working in a primarily CAD environment, this is where 
plans start or permits start and projects start. The design work will be done in a CAD environment. We expect it to be mostly the CAD environment. And then when the plans are in review or completed state for packaging for advertising, that's when you'll be using the SharePoint libraries. You may be doing almost all your work in the Bentley side of things until it's time to send plans out for review or send plans up for final assembly prior to advertising. So will there be another folder called Project Wise? That Project Wise is an entirely separate application, okay. has all the same capabilities and a few that we don't have in SharePoint for managing and organizing your designs and the references. If you're generating a Excel spreadsheet and working on that and you're using that in your design work, that'll stay in Project Wise, that environment, file management environment. At the end of the project, if it's something that's used for plan checking, we'll expect you to take that and put it into the final plans folder for the plan checkers to verify numbers and things like that. But a lot of the work in progress type stuff will stay in project wise. Final deliverables will be archived in SharePoint in this application. But the work in progress and the work in process uh, will stay in project wise primarily. While we're in transition, and we've been in transition for over a year on this, CAD users will continue to use the standard tree structure, but they can use the SharePoint environment for exchanging files in zip form, uh, CAD files, much like you use FTS. And there's nothing stopping you from using FTS if you want to continue to use that. So our objectives for this class and all the subsequent ones are, or is, because there's one major objective, we want you to be able to use this and put things in the right places successfully. So what we're going to cover in this class is some of the basics. We've got nine or ten bullets here. We want to get you so that you can get onto the system understand the terminology that I'm using, know how to get help, and how to move things around. Now, we all have been working in computer systems or with computer systems for years or some of us for decades. We have a normal way we look at the world when working with a computer, that is, you have a file, you know you're going to put it someplace, you say these are the folders I have to choose from, you pick a folder, you then say these are the subfolders I have to choose, you pick that folder and you end up going down that file tree until you say this is where I want to put this. With SharePoint we have the ability to present information in the same way or organize the information in the same way, but we also have the ability to look at it in other ways. Now if you look up here on the screen you see a woman's face on the right and a guy that resembles Bill Clinton playing a saxophone. You may or may not have seen this image before. If you have, you know where I'm going. But what we really have is a way of looking at this. It's really one picture. It just depends on how you come at it, what you want to see, whether it's a woman's face or a saxophone player. And SharePoint gives us the ability to take all this information and organize it like a saxophone player or like a woman's face. And in this presentation and in the advanced presentations that follow, this little icon will come up periodically to remind you that these are the tools that we use to be able to look at things in different ways without moving things around or copying things. Now, first thing you want to do is know how to get to it. You have to be able to get to connect.ncdot.gov. And that's what this page looks like. And I've found that most people in consulting firms has been, have been here at least once, because this is where the roadway design manual sits, among other things. Throughout this presentation, well, let's step back a bit. All of these presentations are available as videos in the help area. We also have videos out on YouTube, which you 
may be using to look at this right now from. We also have these presentations as PowerPoint presentations that you can play at your convenience to refresh your memory at your own speed. Whenever you see a little triangle appear on the screen, that means that there's a movie that you can play. That means that instead of clicking somewhere on the uh, screen or near the top, uh, if you click on or near this triangle, you will be able to get that movie to play. When you first log in, you go to connect.ncdot.gov, which is this site. You go down to the bottom and you see this green button. That green button gives you the ability to go in and log into the system and see files that are not available to the general public. You have to have an NCID to use the system. You have to use NCID backslash and your name as part of your ID and password. We at DOT do not manage the NCIDs. You have to get that directly from the state of North Carolina, ncid.nc.gov. We've navigated to a particular project. We're now in a project and looking at the different libraries, or they're kind of like folders, where documents are stored. You will only see the projects that you have access to. You have access as a member of a consulting firm to projects that you have been given access to, as well as to some webinar training projects. Within those projects, we have a series of discipline libraries where we expect most of your design work will be placed and where you will be sharing information. I'm going to go back and play this movie again just to give you a chance to see it again. Once again, you have to get your NCID from ncid.nc.gov. It will ask you, after you've submitted your request, to set a password and set your security questions. And it's not until you do that that your NCID will be active. You then have to get your NCID registered with your consulting firm. Notice that we clicked on pre-construction at the top of that list. We then have the ability to type in the beginning of the project name and select one of them that pops up from the short list. We have our from and to DOT libraries, which are sort of like in and out boxes, which most people don't use. A bunch of individual libraries. You can think of them as folders. We also have a bunch of division tabs, and the projects are actually organized by division. So you can either search for them, as you saw first, or navigate to the division where the project is going to be built and find your projects there. So we've done the navigation. One other little feature is occasionally in these presentations, you will see a link on the page. That means that you would go in and click on that link and it will actually open up a sub-presentation. All right, this is how things currently look with the R drive. You navigate to a particular project. You expand and contract your folders as needed. You find the folder you're looking for. You look in that folder where you expect to find things. And eventually, you will find it, though you may discover you're running up and down the wrong tree. In a standard tree structure, you start off at the root and you make a decision of which folder you want to go to. You go to that folder, you then navigate up that branch to the next folder, you go down that branch, and eventually you come to a leaf. Maybe. You may find that the folder is empty. You then have to navigate all the way back out and go up to another one to find the next leaf. We also have the concept 
of the web, where you start at one point, you can go here, you can go across here, you have many routes to get to where you want to go. What we're doing with SharePoint is merging our tree and our web, so you have a choice of which way you want to look at things. Is it a saxophone player or a lady's face? So there is a structure to the pre-construction application. Starts off, you're in the overall application. It then has a series of divisions where projects are going to be built and where the project documentation is stored. Each division has its own collection of project sites. We also have a bunch of lists and libraries that you have access to. Now, each division is a collection of project sites. So we're working down our branches here. Every division has its own collection. If we select a particular project, that project is made up of a bunch of libraries, a bunch of page links, and a bunch of lists. This is a project site. Everything before that was a collection of sites or site collection. Each library is a site that contains files, links, and document sets. And we'll be talking about each of those things this morning. So let's uh, just introduce you to some of the terms you're going to hear me use, and we'll be explaining them in a little bit. We have a page, a web page. We have a site, a website. We have a site collection, which is a collection of sites. We have a library, which in some ways is a lot like what you think of as a folder, where files are kept. We have lists, which are like spreadsheets, and they can be associated with project sites or site collections. We have links. That is a link to a file that is someplace else. This is part of our effort to keep from duplicating files, copying them around. We have a document set, which is a folder, and we have what's called a property, which is an attribute of a file or a document set, or actually of a site or a site collection. Property is a generic term that's used in SharePoint. Synonyms for that might be a tag or a keyword or metadata or meta tag. We'll be looking at those in a little bit. So the structure of the pre-construction application starts off at connect.ncdot.gov. That is a collection of sites. From there, you go to the pre-construction application, which is a site collection, and programs to help you use that site collection. That site collection is actually a collection of other site collections, the division site collections. And within the divisions, are the projects, which are project sites. Within those projects are libraries, lists, reports. Within the library are the files. And those files are usually, in the case of disciplines, organized by topic, which is a type of metadata. When we get to a project, you will only see the projects you have access to. You click on that project. From within the division, you have your libraries. This is your chance to try it. Give it a go. All right. And we'll move on. 
We'll talk about getting help. There are several help resources. And in the main screen of the project, all these dark, almost black buttons are on the left. So just to confuse the issue, I put them on the right in the screen. The button at the top, just under the home, is SharePoint Help. That is very good documentation that was written for DOT on generic SharePoint. Uh, it's really useful once you have a clue as to how the system works for uh, doing some customization and things like that. I don't think you'll find it particularly useful until you've been using the product for a while. We have discipline-specific links, and this is listed here because we need to talk about it, but it's not the kind of help for SharePoint or this uh, pre-construction application. But this is just a web page that has links to other useful stuff, uh, such as the roadway design manual, such as the FHWA roadway design pages. There's a link to some pages at App State and at uh, UNC Charlotte that are useful resources for a particular discipline. And this is an area that we are looking to expand. If you have a particular web page that you find useful, that you think other people would be interested in, uh, we're glad to hear about it, and we may be able to quickly add it to that web page. The bottom button in this view is pre-construction help. And this is where you'll find FAQs and library-specific information. And this is where you will find this video you're watching and the presentation that was used to generate that video and many other training materials. Along with a lot of reference videos that are little short clips you'll have seen in this presentation delivered independently. So what I'd like you to do is try it. See if you can answer these questions. Got your numbers? Got your answers? Didn't write them down. <laughs> Who is the contact that adds PEF employees to access lists? It is Deanna Fagan. You will get her by using the email address dot.cmsupport at ncdot.gov. And that actually goes to five of us. Deanna is usually the one that responds, but if she's away from her desk, I will respond or one of my coworkers will respond. How many quick reference documents are there? Well, today is one number. Tomorrow, it may be different. But those are in a column of the red on the right side under reference. And depending on how you interpret the question, it's all the documents or only the ones labeled quick reference. Incidentally, in that uh, list, is the uh, are two or three files that have the uh, authorization for PDHs for these classes. Oh. <laughs> Can subs get access as well as primary consulting firms? Yes. However, the sub will come in as a peer. Now, we actually grant access according to the job that is expected of the consulting firm. So if a consulting firm is brought in to run an entire project, they're a prime. If they want to sub out some of the project management work, they can either request that that sub be under project development only and have access only to, right access only to that area, or they can come in as a prime as well. It doesn't matter to us. But it's a DOT person that has to make the request or authorize the request, uh, identify the consulting firm and their role. So moving on, we have a wonderful little list out there that is essentially a contact list. Matter of fact, it's called Project, Con Project Contacts. In a lot of our paperwork, we know who the primary contact is that is a consulting firm, but we don't know who the person is that's doing the hydraulics work. This is something that we appreciate it if the firms and the DOT staff use for a particular project so that specific people can talk to specific people if it is considered appropriate. If those in the consulting firm only want to have one point of contact, that's the only name that would go in there. Over time, 
that expands. But please use it so we can keep track of who is doing what. Everybody that has access to the project in any form can write to this list. Anyone. So if there's somebody from FHWA that wants to put their name in this list, they can because FHWA does have access to some areas of the project. So this is how Project Context works. And this, for some of you, is the first time you've been exposed to forms. You click on New Item, and then you fill in the blanks. Incidentally, this is real information. So you can actually get at Deanna's real email rather than dot.cm support. Yeah, it's dot.cm support, which is content management support. So give it a go. By filling this in, I know that you've actually taken the course. All right, we'll move on. Okay, project commitments is another list. During a project, in the initial design phases, decisions are made on what a project needs to accomplish. Those are a form of commitment. Uh, once you're underway, decisions are made to determine what a design is going to be or not be. And at some point, you stop and you say, these are our list of design features we want, these commitments. And you can come up with a checklist that says, this is how, they're, uh, how we've done. Have we satisfied all these commitments? These commitments are in documents that are dispersed all over the place. Some are in permit documents. Some are in emails. And this project commitments list is a place to keep track of all that stuff. It's only as good as the information you put into it, however. There's no tool that says, as soon as I've wrote the, written this document or filed this document, that uh, it's magically going to appear in the commitments list. So it's only as good as the work you do. But the whole point of the commitments list is to keep track of this stuff, to generate these checklists, and ultimately to generate what's called the green sheet at the end uh, of the project where it goes out for advertising. So from this commitments link, this is how it works. Once again, you click on New Item and fill in the blanks. Incidentally, those little blue asterisks next to Title and other fields indicate that these are required fields. And in this case, that's all we're going to put in. Incidentally, this list of disciplines uh, has expanded since this movie was made. One of the nice things about these movies is that I can speed them up. I don't type this fast.
and we have a couple of different ways of viewing this information. Not necessarily aesthetically pleasing, but we can at least see what's there. And there are other ways that I'll show you in a little bit that we, this can be used. Okay, let's take a look at the commitments form. Titles required, include is not required. These were the disciplines that were available when we uh, set this presentation together. We've added a couple more disciplines. And these are the include and status options. Use them as you see fit. In some cases, it's very handy to actually put the commitment text from a particular document in here if it's not going to change, rather than having to go out and pull it out of the document later when you're trying to put together other documents. You can be as verbose or as terse as you need to. So give it a try. Now, one of the nice things about lists is that you can dump the information in the list out to Excel. And this is just a quick demo of how that is done. There's are tabs up above the Connect NCDOT, and one of those tabs is for lists. And in that tab is Export to Excel. And what it will do is it will take your current list, take the columns in that view, and create an Excel spreadsheet of all the data. And from that spreadsheet, you can then use that as a checklist or as the beginning of contract requirements, green sheet, or whatever. That's just a teaser for you. We will get into the meat of this lesson, finally, and that is how to get documents into the system. In any library where you have access, you will see a new document or new item option. And that's this new document box. There are other tools for putting new stuff up, but we'll start with this new document one. So this is how it works. From within a library. The 2DOT library is sort of a mailbox where you can dump stuff that's generic. You click on New Document, we're now navigating on your local workstation, in this case through the R drive, to a particular file. You select the file. That optional comment sticks with this particular version of the file. When you upload the file, you will see it. And if you upload that same file again, you have an opportunity to put a new comment on the new version. And the previous one will still be there. We then have a title field, which is a courtesy field. You can put whatever you want in there. And then you indicate the disciplines that this particular file would be of interest to. We then have a pre-con phase, where in the project this file will fit, because that is how these files are organized in pseudo folders of the pre-con phase. So to play that movie again, go into the library. that you want to move the file into, click on New Document. Click on the Browse button. It depends on the browser where that Browse button will be. In Internet Explorer, it's over on the right. This is uh, Chrome, I think. Put in a comment if you wish. Say OK. Now you notice that you upload the file and then you indicate the properties. In a normal computer environment that we've been accustomed to, you have to decide where you're going to put something before you put it. Here, the only decision is which library. 
and then all of the rest of the information is actually set after you've loaded the file. The file is loaded and now you fill out the form. So you're making the same decisions or similar decisions as you did before, but the sequence is different. Now, all that information in that form was a bunch of different properties. The file name was a property, and all the others as well. And let's talk a little bit about properties and how they're used and why they're used. And I have this illustration, this poster here in the lower left-hand corner. I haven't had a student that is young enough to have never seen a card catalog in a school library. But I'm sure that's coming up. But when you're looking for a book in a library, you go to the online catalog now, but it used to be a bunch of drawers, and you had a choice of three different ways to look it up. That book had an ID number, Dewey Decimal or Library of Congress, typically. You'd go to the card catalog, and you could find that book under the title. You could also find that book under one or more authors, so that was a different property. And subject was the third property, and depending on how many subjects that book addressed, you would have a card for each subject. All of that information in that card catalog was metadata. And as I said a little earlier, the properties of a file are metadata. We may call them tags, we may call them keywords, we may call them meta tags, we may call them attributes. But they're associated with the file but not actually part of the content. So we have this pinkish document here. It has an ID number, 10.020, like the Dewey Decimal. It has a title. It has a date. It actually has several dates. The date it was uploaded, the date it was modified, the date it was checked out. We may have something that indicates what kind of document it is, in this case, PDF plans. Uh, we may have a special note. It may have a particular type. It's a NEPA supporting document, or that may be a key word. We know who did it. Who put it up there? Who modified it? Who has it checked out? All of this information is associated with it, and we can look at this file, search for this file, with any one of these values or combination of these values. We're not tied to just where it is in the file structure and its file name. So let's take a look at the properties for the from and to DOT libraries. We have the name, the file name, and incidentally, when you load a file, once it's in the system and you're filling out this form, you actually can change the file name. Now, you cannot load a file that has an ampersand, a pound sign, a question mark, a percent sign, and a few other special characters in it. It will refuse to accept it. You then have the title. We don't use the title for organization. You can use the title, however, for whatever you want. It's often used as a friendlier, more verbose, description of what the file is rather than just the file name. You then have the precon discipline, and you can select one or more values here. And you can search for this by any one of these values. Precon phase, this is how our default view is organized by phase, where in the project this uh, file is typically sitting. And notes is common to almost all the files that we upload. You can put anything in here that you want. Uh, this is a multi-line field. You can put in lots of words. You can find it by the words. You think of this as a sticky note that you may stick on a document. And here's a chance to upload a document. You don't have to replay that movie. Here's the step-by-step -step procedure. All right, what's next? All right, the from and to DOT libraries are generally not used now, especially for larger projects. They're used for data exchange still. There are some divisions, uh, particularly divisions two and three, where the project managers for small projects, where they may only be 50 or 100 pages, they don't want to have a few files dispersed across 
a bunch of libraries. We've got 15, 20 discipline libraries, and they don't want to go to a library just to find one or two files. They want them all in the 2DOT library or the From DOT library so that they're convenient in their little bundle. Other divisions and uh, the central projects don't ever want to see stuff in the 2DOT library. They want it to go into the discipline where the uh, information should be, regardless of the size of the project. Now, regardless of where files should go, CAD files should be zipped, and you should zip the entire tree so you get all the references. Now, there is one restriction on the 2DOT library, and that is uh, the consulting firms cannot delete files once they're placed in the 2DOT library. DOT staff cannot even write to the 2DOT library. Now keep in mind that any time you put a file anywhere in the system, almost everybody has read access to every library if they have a role in that project. And once again, unlike FTS, files don't disappear. Now the precon phase is used to group the files in folders and I have the folders in quotes because they're not really folders. It's just a property and we're sorting and grouping by that particular property. That's the default view when you get into a from or to DOT library. Discipline libraries are much like the uh, project store, our drive discipline libraries. We expect the material to be put in there. They have shared contribute access with all the project participants in that discipline. So if you're DOT staff or if you're a PEF working in that discipline and your firm has access to that discipline, you have common access. The files in a discipline library are organized by default by topic. So let's talk about topics a little bit. Every single discipline library has topics unique to that discipline. There are some topics that are common across all disciplines. So in this particular case, we're displaying these files grouped by topic. So you see that there's the archaeology topic with the files under it, and then there's a the historic architecture topic and the uh, scale of my view, meeting documents topic. Now, the topic is just one of the properties that we have here. How many properties, different types of properties, do you see here on the screen? Uh, no, I'm not talking about the three different topics. Those are topic values. The topic is a property. Archaeology, historic architecture are, to are topic values. But the topic or the property is the human environment topic or HE topic. So what are the other properties you see on this screen in this view? Archaeology, historic architecture, and meeting documents are property values. How many different properties? HE topic is a property. There are other properties displayed here. Draft, that is a property value. The property is state. So that is a property. You see the red state at the top, column headers. Column headers are properties. So how many properties do you see? In this view, five. HE topic, name, modified, modified by, and state. 
Those are the five properties. Property values are September 22nd, Lawrence D. Bowder, I go by Larry, draft, and file names, and the historic architecture, and meeting documents, etc. Now, there are a lot more properties available, uh, property values in topic. We're only seeing three because that's the only ones that have uh, files in. There's no navigating to empty folders once you get to a discipline. You have six or eight properties to choose from. The only the property values that you're using will be displayed. So on the left, we have the property values for human environment. In the middle, we have the property values for natural environment. And on the right, we have the property values for project development. So these are the pseudo folders within those disciplines that are available. And actually, the uh, project development properties, you're only seeing the first two thirds. So another property is the state. And we have four states, and these are not required anywhere, uh, but work practices, when we get into review, suggest them strongly. State can be left blank. You can set that to draft, submitted, in review, and final. And uh, in the advanced class where we talk about the uh, review process, we talk about how those state values are changed and who changes them to indicate the status of a particular file. In project wise, which is the Bentley tool, the status or the state may be used to actually control who has access, who has right access to a file at, at a particular time in the review process. But there is no control as far as who can do something with the state inside SharePoint. Key documents. This is another property that is useful for keeping track of documents that are significant in some way. Satisfy one of these four bullet points. Any document that explains, justifies, or documents a decision made during the design process should be labeled as a key document. Every single discipline that has that kind of role has a decision document value to use if one of the others is not appropriate. Precon notes, it's a freeform text field. You can't sort by it, you can't filter by it, but you can certainly find stuff by it. So it's useful information associated with a document. So let's give you a chance to try playing around with some properties in the utility library. Moving on then. So you're starting to see how the properties can be used to look at files in different ways, and you're going to have a lot more chance as we move through this training. Now, we actually have more than just files that we can store in these libraries. The new document button is the one I pointed out to you. And I'm going to make a huge fuss about this because you look up the there at the top of the sc screen, up above Connect and CDOT are three tabs. That's the strangest place to put things, and people forget that they are there. But that is where. You have the ability to go in and do things with your library, change your views, do things with files. Under the Files tab are, are the different file tools. And there's more than what we see here. But up there, you see that there's a new document and upload document. And just to make life interesting, the new document button in the body, the one with the plus sign next to it that you used in an earlier exercise, corresponds to the upload document button in the files tab. They're the same thing. Now, the new document button to the left of that that I've got circled actually is a two part. The top 
just opens up an empty Word document for you. And I don't think anybody hardly ever uses this because usually you're working with an existing Word document that you're putting into the library rather than starting from scratch. The bottom half of that icon allows you to create an empty Word document, create a link, and create a document set. Now, a document set is essentially a folder with properties. The link is something that looks like a file that's sitting in your library, but really is pointing to a file that's someplace else, and it can be anywhere in the world. The new document set creates a folder that you can put stuff in. Notice that the actual folder icon up there is grayed out. We do not want you to create folders. Now, there are ways of getting around it, but files in document sets can be found using search. Files in folders cannot. It's the one habit that we are struggling to get people to break is the creation of folders in this environment because as soon as you put things in a folder, they get obscured. There are better ways to manage information. So let's talk about document sets. They work like folders to bundle stuff together. But unlike folders, when you put a file in a document set, some of the properties of the document set are automatically inherited by the file. If you want to put a bunch of files in and have them all have the same value, and you just put them in the library itself, you have to go in and individually set the property values for those files. If you create a document set, set the properties in the document set, such as the topic, every file you put in that document set automatically inherits that property. Now, document sets are another object like a file. They do not allow special characters. The uh, parentheses, the hyphen, the underscore, and we've also recently discovered the equal sign are legal values to put in a file name. A lot of people like to use ampersands and pound signs in file names. You can't do that here. So this is how we create a document set. Click on the bottom half of the icon, select the document set, and document sets are uniquely named in each library. Give the document set a name, set the appropriate properties. In this case, because it's project development, we also have a merger or concurrence point property we can set and a description. And when we create the document set, you notice that that description appears just under the document set name. This is an empty document set. And look at this, we can click and drag files into SharePoint. And when they arrive, we're going to speed things up here. They already have the property set. Now you're going to see a few more things here as far as file manipulation and management tools. If we click on that row and go up to the Files tab, we can edit the properties. Notice that the property values, topic, and CP are already filled in. We can give this file its, a un its unique title. Title is not displayed. Also notice that the state has been set. When this movie was made, that was a default value. It's no longer a default. Notice the state is not set on the document set itself. This is another way to get at information about the file. Click on the ellipsis, click on the ellipsis again, three dots. The technical term for that is ellipsis. We're going to change the state to review. Go back up to the library level. And there's our document set. So in addition to seeing how we create a document set, you've also seen two different ways
to get at the form to edit properties for a file that's already in the system. You also saw that we can click and drag out of a Windows Explorer view into the browser library or into the document set itself inside that library. So a quick review. They work like folders. However, files dropped into them assume the specific properties of the parent. Not all properties, just some of the properties. Unfortunately, unlike folders, you cannot put a document set inside a document set. You have to use properties to do any further grouping. And like a folder, you have to create the document set before you move stuff into the document set. And there is a help file out there, quick reference on document sets. There are a couple of actually quick references that have document set information in them. There's also an older video you can see what the uh, product looked like when we only had a from a 2 dot library. So remember, it's the bottom part of the icon, new document icon, and then you select the document set to create it. Now, let's also look at drag and drop before we have you do a lab exercise. When you do a drag and drop, you're dragging from a Windows Explorer view, that's the file manager, if you've been around a while, into a special area of the web browser window. You drag an into the file list area until you see a blue box that says drop here. If you drop outside of that blue box, if you've dragged multiple files, the first one will open up in the browser window, if it's possible. In other words, uh, if you're dragging a, a CAD file, it won't open up in the browser window because the browser window doesn't recognize it. But if you drag a Word document or an image or a spreadsheet, it will automatically just open the file inside the browser window. So you have to drag until you see that blue box appear. Now, you don't have to see the whole blue box. Just a part of it was showing in that demo video you saw. But there's a very common mistake that people make. And you see it's slightly grayed out where it says new document or drag files here. A lot of people feel they have to click there first, and what that does is open up the new document pop-up, and drag and drop will not work. And it's so common that I have this special warning here, so I occasionally still make this mistake, and I've been using this product for over a year, well over a year. So, give it a try. I want to put in a reminder that if you try to click and drag a file name with a special character, such as a pound sign or an ampersand, or an apostrophe, you may have problems moving it. It won't let you. So, have you felt like this sometime today? Let's just... Review these things one more time. Special characters can be a problem. Spaces are allowed. Now, when you do a click and drag, you can't drag more than 100 files at a time. And it will tell you that. It's a good idea to move a batch of files at a time. I actually did an exercise of taking a bunch of files from a discipline and moving it. I think it was geotechnical because they were very well organized. And it took me about four hours to move everything. It was a sizable project. But you move a chunk, you set the properties, you move another chunk, you set the properties. Or you create a document set and move a chunk. Another reminder that when you're working with CAD files, Make sure you zip them up and make sure you zip up the entire tree, not just the individual files, because you want to preserve the references as much as possible. And links to eTracks. I'm not going into eTracks, but I do want to talk to you about how you can pull links, because links are useful in more than just eTracks. To pick up a link, you click on the ellipsis next to the file name in the file listing. Those three dots are called an ellipsis. You then, in the pop-up that appears, 
right click in the window where you see the URL and then you can copy the shortcut or just copy it. That gives you the URL that you can paste somewhere. An easier way and a slightly more aesthetically pleasing way is to highlight the clickable file name, click and drag over it, and then right click on it. And if you copy shortcut, what you get is the URL. If you instead use copy or control C, you get the file name, but it is a link. And you can paste that into a Word document, into an email, or you can paste the link into a link that you've created in your library when you want to get something from somebody else without copying it. And don't forget help. There's actually a couple of places you can find help. The big black button. There's also a pre-construction help link on the left once you're inside a project. Now, you've got questions. You can send questions or problems to dot at ncdot.gov. And these are the things we'd like to know. Now, you can't necessarily tell us everything, but we support more than just this pre-construction project. So if you say, I can't do this in SharePoint, it doesn't help us a whole lot because we have several SharePoint applications we're supporting. Sometimes we don't even know who you are. It helps sometimes. And if you want us to call you back, it's helpful to give us a number. So as much of this information as you can give us is appreciated in the email that you send us. And this is what we're covering in the advanced topics. So that's it for this class.